Thank you guys for coming. Um, Our pleasure. Yeah, I'm going to host it. Be easy. I'll ask questions. Um, these guys are great, right? I need yeah. to finish this. It's a fire. Great when you meet them at the table. Have you guys been uh, downstairs sorry. talking with them? Yeah. So, my first question Eddie and the Cruisers. Uh, how did you get that part? Do you recall how you got the role in that? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> you know, I met Matt and Marty Davidson, the director, at the same time. And I went in for the interview. We were coming back from uh, the Caribbean, shooting a couple episodes of Greatest American Hero. And I go in and And Marty says, so, do you play guitar? And I said, yeah, like Jimi Hendrix, man. <laughs> and do you sing? And I said, well, you know, it's kind of like a Sinatra, you know, thing. And he goes, mm-hmm. And do you write? And I said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not a writer, man. I'm just a rock and roll. <laughs> we get on location, he finds out I can't sing, I can't play guitar, I've never been live on stage, and it all was kind of a magical thing. So it was uh, a real Hollywood story. It was, uh, thank God Matt was there. <laughs> he was there. Remember when we, uh, we, had, we had to sing for um, uh, Joe Brooks? Joe Brooks was originally going to write all the songs. Do you know who Joe Brooks is? He did that a very you light up my life called You Light Up My Life. Oh. Of which he did a movie also. And he was originally gonna do the music. We go in to meet Joe Brooks, and Joe Brooks is gonna play a few of the songs from the movie. And he sits down at the piano, and Joe Brooks is a character. He's he has a terrible lisp, but he can sing great. So when he sings, it's fine. But he sits down at the piano, he says, Okay, you ready? He goes, uh, for down on my down on my na 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 na, and and he's you gotta come in then. I said, oh okay okay okay, I'm standing there, and he says, all right now you ready? Down on my and, and said, you gotta come in there, man. Said, oh all right, and Marty Davidson blows up. This isn't rock and roll. This is bullshit. We're not gonna movie about real hardcore rock and roll. And just as Marty's saying that, I sit down in a faint. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get that part? It was magic. It was magic. <laughs> Matt, same question. How did, do you recall? I, yeah, I do. Actually, uh, I had I got a call to go in and meet with Marty and his sister Arlene, who was his partner, his producing partner. And uh, it's, actually, I went there, and there were a bunch of act. Jeff Goldblum was sitting there, and a bunch of people getting ready to go in to read. And I walked in, and I talked to Marty for a few minutes and he said, uh, do you play any instruments? Uh, at that time, um, you, Eddie played the bass and Sal was the lead guitarist. They were looking at like the sting thing. Yeah, yeah like a sting thing. And um, <laughs> so I said, well, I play the sax and the accordion. And I played the accordion in, when I was 13 or something. Um, he said, do you play guitar? I said, I play the best air guitar that you've ever seen. And I did. And he said, um, okay, I'm going to want to see that. I said, that's fine. You just pick a song and I'll play air guitar to it. Uh, we talked for a few minutes, more minutes, and then he, had, he said, can you come back tomorrow and we'll read a couple of the scenes. I said, sure. So I came back with a cassette player with Santana on it, Black Magic Woman by Santana. And I stood in the office and did air guitar every note of Black Magic Woman. And Marty was blown away by it. No, easy. It's easy with air. It's really easy. It's just air. It's not I have to teach him everything music. I'm just telling you. I'm, you can be off key, on key, nobody knows. It's air. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. anyway um, so then uh, we got, I got the part. Uh, actually, they hired Michael. Um, none of us knew each other. And Marty said, we're going to take a few people to New York. This is in LA. And we're going to do some improvs and put different people together and everything. And Michael and I, I got there and we hung out. I remember walking down the street with you in New York before we actually went up and did it. And there was, 
there was just an instant, we had an instant relationship, which I, it was for me, it was total acting because I couldn't stand him. But he really felt something from me. And um, I was much thinner. Um, and we just went on from there. It was, it, the whole thing was an The girl at that improv session was Springsteen's girlfriend. That's right. It was oh, a she had girl in long, hair. curly hair. Oh, she had short black hair like Chrissy Hines. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the game Telephone. You know how you remember different things? Yeah. What was her name? I don't know. She was Springsteen's girlfriend. Right. <laughs> That's why she didn't get the part. She had no persona of her own. She was Springsteen's girlfriend. I think. Anyway. And so then they cast the movie and we were in. And the journey began. <laughs> the journey began. Um, so, Eddie and the Cruises got made. The, the music was done by um, John Cafferty, and uh, which you lip synced. And I got a question for that a little later on. And the movie got released, and everybody was thinking it was going to do, you know, tremendous business. And some, you know, I've been reading about this a lot, and it can never be explained why it happened that it didn't take off in the theaters. Right. And then uh, it went to uh, HBO. And uh, WHT for you people in the Northeast, which is uh, an early version of Showtime, and video. And then this thing takes off. And then all of a sudden they re-released it in the theaters. But whether it, it did big business or not, then Eddie and the Cruises is huge. The record comes back out again. The, the cassettes, that this is before CDs, the cassettes start selling. So what did you feel like after the theatrical release didn't happen, all of a sudden, there's this big noise. Uh, the reason the original theatrical release didn't work is because Sugar, Irish Sugar or Sugarman, didn't want to put up the PA. He thought it was an obscure movie. And then when it went on to HBO, he realized what a mistake he made, but it had already been released to the public. Mm -hmm. So the second theatrical release, just, you know, people that could watch it on HBO, are they going to go spend whatever it costs to go to a movie? Way back then. Yeah. <laughs> the amazing thing was, when it came on cable, and you know, when you're doing a film, especially a small independent film, you never know how it's going to do. It's not, I'm sitting down there at the table, and I'm sure you feel the same way. I'm thinking, this movie is 30 years ago. There is no way while we were making this movie that we thought we'd be sitting here today, wow. 30 years later, and have people love that movie and come up and talk to you about it. But when it went on cable, and you gotta remember, 30 years ago, cable was not what it is now. A lot of people didn't even have it. The album went triple platinum immediately almost and that's when guys like Larry Sugar or Sugarman or whoever went oh my lord because people went this is incredible I mean the music was the first thing that hit really big and then people started watching it on cable and it got you know it got to the point where it is today where people love this movie but you know, the same thing happened to that Robert Duvall movie, The Great Santini and the Ace. You know, they didn't realize how good it was and how much people were going to react to it. So that happened, the same thing. They released it theatrically, it didn't work, HBO, big success, and then theatrically again. And that was like Robert Duvall's first big lead. So, you know, the audience uh, can sometimes be wiser than uh, Hollywood moguls. That that sort of actually happened to you guys again with Streets of Fire. Um, which uh, got released, and it wasn't until after it had already come out that it built up this cult following. It was an enormous success in Europe, in Germany and Japan. The Japanese flew me over there to meet the Prince of Japan. It's uh, the, I think it's in the top 25 movies of all time in Asia. Uh, they had the poster on the Great Wall of China. A friend of mine from a, a pizzeria in Ventura came back and there's a picture of Streets of Fire. And he's standing in front of a poster and it's the Great Wall of China. You know, so again, Hollywood doesn't always know what the audience is gonna buy. And if you let it sit just a little bit longer in the theater, who knows? Like a good meal, right? That, uh, that movie, Streets of Fire, which is a great movie. I mean, uh, as a rock and roll fable, which I love, the whole thing about it was great. Um, with me, 
I was actually, I got a call one day because Michael and I had worked so closely on Eddie and the Cruisers. Um, and this was a big studio movie that Walter Hill was going to direct. And he wanted Michael to star in this movie really badly. And I got a call from Walter Hill. Uh, he asked me to come in and I talked to him. And I thought, oh, cool, I'm going to go in and talk to Walter about <coughs> being in this movie. And he asked me if I would be the acting coach on the movie because I had done such phenomenal work with Michael. <laughs> that's, that's not a joke. And then he asked me if I could work on Matt's English. <laughs> and so I said I would love to, and I, I wanted to be around Walter, who is a great director, and it meant I could spend more time with Mikey and do all that. And then he ca I, I'm in one scene in the movie, I played the thin cop. <laughs> My friend Peter Jason is fat cop, I'm thin cop. But he came to me one day and says, you want to be in this? And I said, yeah, sure. And he wrote a scene in it for the two of us. But it's a great, it, if you haven't seen it, it's a great movie. It really is. I, I Willem Dafoe uh, and- Diane Lane. Diane Lane, a very young Diane Lane. She was great. There were a bunch of people in there. Bill Paxton. Diane Lane was in the makeup trailer and she gets a package delivered and she's opening this envelope and she goes, yes. I said, what's that, Diane? She says, I got all B's in my report card. <laughs> I'm not kidding, she was, she was still getting, you know, getting the home, not homeschooled, but a studio school. She was 17 years old. But she had already worked with Lawrence Olivier. It's a question for you, Michael. Uh, Eddie and the Cruz is when the cable popularity was going on. Did anybody ever come up to you and say, sing? <laughs> I'll tell you, man, it was so tempting to say, yeah, that was me singing. Yeah, yeah, that was me singing, and uh, I've got a contract with NASA to open a studio on the moon. Yeah, yeah, that's it. NASA is going to record me now. Yeah, it was really tempting, and a lot of people did come up and ask me to sing, and I recorded something, and I really wanted to record, be, do the voice in Eddie, too. But, you know, they expect John Carpenter's voice. You know, and I'm not the first one to do that in um, um, West Side Story. Natalie Wood and uh, Tony, those are lip sync jobs also, and they're really fucking good, I mean, really good jobs also. <laughs> and uh, also, we saw on the, we watched Al Jolson's, when he sang the anniversary, there was like the Al Jolson story, the jazz singer, that actor also lip synced. And you didn't realize it. I mean, it's a technique. It's not, you know, there is a certain magic because you don't know if the audience is going to buy, you know, the tone and the timbre and, and the facial expressions. And if they do, you got a winner. If you don't, right in the toilet. Okay, now I'm going to tell you the real story behind this. <laughs> this lip sync. <laughs> you ready? Um, we, the way we did the movie, we did acting stuff they hadn't finished the music and we started filming and we were working during the day on the scenes the acting scenes and then at night we'd go back to like the rickshaw motel where we were staying cherry hill new jersey, hill, new jersey. and uh we would work as a band and we were horrible i mean horrible Southside johnny do you all know Southside johnny he worked with us as a band and he would get really upset. And, um, Michael, me, David Wilson, who had, was learning to play the drums, uh, tunes, Michael Ann tunes, the sax player was the real sax player from Beaver Brown. He was in there, but we, Helen Schneider was also a rock star in real life. But the three of us, we, I mean, we were trying to get to be a band and it was hard, it was really hard. And Michael, this is the truth, Michael, was horrible at lip syncing because we didn't have the songs. We didn't have any. We didn't have any songs. I mean, that's, no, don't take this personally. Don't get mad because there's a happy ending to this. <laughs> In all of Matt's stories, he's a savior. <laughs> before, you, before you take him too serious, you gotta remember there's a certain level of embellishment. Yeah, what's your point? that comes along with being an actor? What's your point? Okay. When you get a, to the walking on water, you can take I'll a make a long story short. Okay. A large story. A large story. Shorter. Um, we we work on this music, and we finally have the music. And right before we're about to start shooting 
the music scenes. And I don't remember exactly when it happened, but magic took place because not only were we a band, but I have seen almost every movie, this is the truth, where somebody is lip syncing. Michael's lip syncing in Eddie is the best lip syncing that has ever been done in a music movie. Um, not only because of the, the sound of John's voice and it fits, it fit Eddie, but his lip syncing is perfect. There is not one note that does not look like it's coming out of him. It's it, to this day I watch it and it's staggering how good it is. But really. No, what we're not mentioning is Helen Schneider's husband, manager, George Nasser. He took Helen out of high school and took her to Germany and turned her into a rock star. I mean, she could sing, but she he took her on the road and made her a big star in Germany. And he saw what the struggle was. And when I started working close with him, he became the secret weapon. He didn't get any credit. Nobody gave him any acknowledgement. But I brought him up for Eddie and the Cruisers Part Two because I said, listen to the Scotty brothers. I need George Nasty. And they didn't question. Suddenly George was there and they knew that it was going to be the same situation. But they did the same job, and Eddie too. But, you know, again, it is technique, and there's a lot of luck and magic involved. But, you know, we were all young, you know, and they tell you to imagine and pretend when you're young. You can You know, it's like, okay, okay, yeah, okay, fine, yeah. Just, just imagine your guitar is a certain part of your anatomy. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, I got it, I got it. And you don't question, you know, and, uh, the magic that happens when you're, geez, man, we were really young, and we have, I had a, I had a, you know, greatest American hero. I was a, you know, I had maybe three, four lines every episode. I had a very small resume. <laughs> so when it was like I had nothing to lose, you know, fine, I'll go back to cooking <laughs> if they don't like what I'm doing. Uh, we're running uh, out of time, but can anybody have a question? Questions for the audience? Yes. I'm just wondering, both of you, what your feelings are on the scene in Eddie 2 that was essentially changed from the original, the scene on the beach? Uh, the scene that was with Tom. Right. And we put it in Eddie 2 with, with Sal and, and Eddie. I think it was a good idea. Okay. I think it was a good idea. Um, I mean, weren't they, were they at all concerned that, I mean, I think it was about a five-year span between the movies that people are going to remember that the scene was really with... The word man character. I mean, was, I'm just asking: Was there a lot of concern at the time when that scene was? I don't. Out? I don't really know what went on because I just got a call that they wanted me to do it, okay. and I was very happy that they did. And I thought that those scenes for the second movie were crucial. Right. I mean, okay. you know. So I don't. Maybe Michael knows a little more about. It. Um. When the producers come to you and say, we're going to do this, you can waste your time fighting with them. Right. Or you can just prepare to perform. Right. You know, and it's much better spend time preparing because it's out of your control. Right. Because they know I'm not doing it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Please, Have you gone to see John Rafferty do any of the music recently? I saw him about six years ago. He was doing a, a, he brought in Gary guitar and tunes. One of the guys in the band died. And they did a, a concert for some corporate event in uh, Calabasas, California. And I went to see him and you know, they do the same song. You know, it's, it's just like being back in uh, Tony Marks. I, you know, they're, they're great guys. And John, you know, he gets a little angrier, a little, you know, a little rougher. Tunes gets a little happier and more born free, you know. <laughs> Gary Guitar is, uh, teaches music. He's like School of Rock. As soon as I said it, he finished the sentence. I said, School of Rock, yeah, I know, I heard it. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Uh, Mike, I just wanted to thank you very much. Um, that movie actually was a very key uh, part of my life before I became a musician singer, guitar player, drummer. Uh, similar situation, we were put on the spot to put a band together like overnight. And uh, without movie magic, it, it came to be that it went on to be uh, an eight year career. So, oh, congratulations, man. That's, that's awesome. That's really... 
I just wanted to say, you know, I, I admire that movie very much. And thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great note to end on. Um, guys, thank you for coming. I really wanted to ask about other things for the experiment. But you guys can ask them down in the room where they're signing and meet them. I'm sure they'll be. Thank you.